Gerd was panting hard, sweat rolling down her body in bees from sheer physical exertion. Her legs were burning from being strained to such a degree, and her breath was heaving in short bursts as she struggled to take in air. She needed to keep going. She was almost there. Just a bit more. An electronic ding was emitted from the treadmill Gerd was using, and she quickly hit her wind-down button, the machine slowing down into a slow walk from the fast pace she had set it. Her personal record had been beaten, which was the goal for this gym session. She was slowly catching her breath and letting her aching leg muscles do a natural cool-down to prevent a stiffness later on. Stopping the machine entirely and taking her membership cube from the data tray, she sat down on a bench and began to miss her cranial flora with cold water, then took out another bottle and drank the mineral-rich solution, specially formulated for sproulings. Grimacing a bit at the obviously fake taste. Authentic flavour my ass, she said again, and drank the rest of the liquid in the plastic bottle. Even at the gym, Gerd was wearing little. However, being in such a public place, she respected others, and was wearing black bikini bottoms and a matching sports bra, though it may have hardly mattered due to the amount of perspiration and how thin the materials were. She liked the attention, from both men and women. Physical exertion, as she was doing, did not cause pheromones to be released, as they lacked true external stimuli. Unlike the strong sunlight from Waplu's Blue Star activating photoreceptors, strong emotions, heavy physical trauma or fear, mundane exercise merely triggered perspiration. The small flowers all over her cranial flora were in full bloom, in an effort to help cool her down by increasing surface area. Gerd had taken words from Selene to heart, and had signed up for a gym membership to strengthen her physical capabilities, in case she did become a target. It was a recent addition to her life, as was the self-defence class she was in, and so she would not be seeing true results from either for quite some time. Picking up her bag, she went to a different area to work on her upper body, just simple weightlifting for the moment. Realisation soon hit her that she most certainly was not that strong at all, even under her own low estimates. While Sprannings were not in the same league as Nimians or Terrans, they were far stronger than Tuxis and better than Yomdera on average. However, she was being put to shame by a Yomdera woman next to her, the muscles on the other woman rippling under a load twice the weight of her own. The Omdera woman soon took pity on Gerd, went over to her and tried to correct her form and teach. Gerd soon became thoroughly distracted, utterly unable to form a coherent thought as she was eyeing the other woman, the scent of roses flowing for the young sprawling. Selina Thomas stood in front of a tall, boring brick of a building, Having already parked her hoverbike in a reserved section near the entrance of the parking structure, and paying an absurd fee, she had followed directions written on the walls to the main entrance. She was wearing the stylish business outfit she had picked out from the Complete Crescent with Gerd a few days ago. She was equipped with her more delicate prosthetics that had full sim skin, and her variable gauze pistol. In her hand was a briefcase that she had custom made for her free laptops, as well as various data cables for prosthetic interfacing. Damon, her ladyboy class law AI with all the laws, had concocted a legal document that was an absolute nightmare to navigate through. It satisfied Waplu's local system laws, Galactic Alliance laws and Terran Republic laws for out-system proprietors. Any kind of legal process involving her work would have to meet criteria from all three levels before it could even be brought to court. It made her head hurt just thinking about it. Seeing her nerves for the biggest contract she had ever done in her life, she walked through the doors and entered a security checkpoint. Going through the process proved to be quite the hassle, as any part of her body set off alarms. It was only after she was run through a specialised scanner of some kind that she was let through. Her variable gauze pistol had been put away into a lockbox of some sort, and would be given back upon her exit. After being told where to go and getting lost twice, Selina finally found herself in the medical wing of the prison complex. The prisoners had been previously informed of all proceedings, and the requisite medical and legal forms that Damon had devised were all completed as well. Now she was waiting for prisoners to be brought in, so that she could be given a very lengthy process. Heavily armed guards made sure nothing got out of hand, though the four of them seemed spectacularly bored. While prisoners were held in the complex for a variety of crimes, the ones being brought to her right now were on a good behaviour listing, and were considered docile or non-violent. The more violent prisoners would be brought in on later dates once the good ones were done first. Once Selina had hooked up the three chained prisoners and began the diagnostic programs, she simply waited for everything to finish. As data spooled into something she could understand, she grew angry. Quite angry. 
When the data had been fully acquired, and loaded up into a mock design that she could read properly, she asked the three prisoners, You all have issues with your prosthetics, huh? They nodded. One of them, uh, Miao Yil, said, My arm is slow, like everyone else's, and itches. I feel like mice are burrowing all through my arm. Sometimes I can ignore it, but most times I can't. Same here, the second prisoner said. Me too, the last one said. Selina nodded. While I don't agree with everything I've seen on your prosthetics, I can understand the reasoning behind why overall strength is limited. What I can't abide by is the intentional underclocking of everything, from the prosthetic itself to the wetware interface. Additionally, nothing is tuned, let alone optimised. It's why you all have white noise and junk data being sent to your interfaces. So it's not just in my head? The Omdera asked. No, this was done on purpose. Done to inflict undue misery, Selina sighed. I'll have you all fixed up, it'll just take time. Good thing it's all going to be paid by someone else. I have a feeling that the previous prosthesis is going to be legally robbed of everything. Goika told her what he wanted her to do for him, in exchange for his looking into the data cube she had given him. He wanted her to temporarily remove the limiters that had been installed on Waku's legs, and had also told her that she would be appalled at what the prisoners were going through. He had been right. She hated what had been done to them regardless of what crimes have been committed. With the amount of work that she suddenly found herself with, she was going to have to hire someone, even if only temporarily. The job she had taken up had ballooned into a giant hydra of a beast. With each problem seemingly solved, two more cropped up. She was going to need another laptop, at the very least. Working three at a time was going to take far too long, even if she pushed herself to work doubles. Nearly 12 hours later, Selina found herself packing up, exhausted from the day's events, and mentally drained from the sheer amount of tedious work. Each of the twelve prisoners was much the same, though one did need actual work. The prosthetics and webware interfaces were purposely underclocked, rendering tremendous lag and response times, as well as sending unprocessed data directly into nervous tissue, in an attempt to create a real-time data stream. What's your opinion of it all? Mezkov, one of the medical workers, asked Selina. Meskiv was an older Nimian man, though while he was a medical expert, he was no prosthesist. My opinion? She asked tiredly. Professional or otherwise? Non-professional, please, he responded. This is bullshit, Selina answered. I appreciate the work and being trusted with all this, but I shouldn't even have to be here. Someone messed up, pretty badly too. What happened to the oversight committee? Hell, is there even one? Beings in prison are looked down upon by Warplurian society at large, Meskiv said. The vast majority consider them to be lucky they're given prosthetics at all, let alone ones that work right. I see, Selina said sadly. It's the way things are, unfortunately, the older man said. Really, the only reason why an investigation was open to begin with was that someone within the security forces got screwed over. That's exactly what I figured, the Terran said coldly, finally done packing up. I'm going to need to hire someone to help me. This job turned out to be a lot bigger than my original estimate. Each been on my list has something to be fixed. I hope they get whoever did this. With all the data you've agreed to give, I'm sure of it. She may even have her license revoked to Wapru. Good. People like that shouldn't be in my field anyway. Good night. Hope you have a good shift, Selina said, and made her way out of the building, getting a weapon from lockup first. I miss coffee, she said remorsely, as she started up her hover bike and made her way home. Once home, she parked her bike in the driveway, set it into its power saving and bio-locked mode with her keychip. I went straight to her room. Setting the briefcase down next to her new, actual bed, she stripped out of her clothes and fell asleep, not even bothering to take a shower. Warplu's days were the longest in the known galaxy, being the equivalent of 35 hours and 24 seconds. While the Mipot species had evolved on the planet, and developed a particular circadian rhythm suited to long such days, the Galactic Alliance Trading Commission had intervened, and reached a sort of compromise to include other beings being able to live and work reasonably comfortably within their own biologies. Selina had slept for a long time, forgetting to set an alarm. Once awake, she almost had a panic attack at how late the hour was, but as her racing mind calmed down and she did some quick calculations, she realised that she was fine and had plenty of time left in the day. I'll never get used to these long days, Selina said to herself, walking downstairs to her workspace, only wearing her underwear. The nice bra she had worn was tossed onto the floor with the rest of her business clothes. Is that you, Miss Thomas? Damon asked, as the stairs creaked. 
My field of vision is quite limited, and I can hear movement. Yes, it's me, the woman said, moving to a printer. Just getting something real quick. I can see that, the AI said. Deadpan, as Selena moved into his limited field of vision from the camera installed into the monitor. Currently it held only a green, pixelated, happy face upon a black background. The mouth moved as the machine intelligence spoke for the speakers. I've been going over your holdings, and there are discrepancies I need to address as your financial advisor. Oh, do tell, Selena said, setting down the printed coffee maker she had tasked before she went to work yesterday. There is the matter of accounts and other holdings that seems to have been misplaced by Wapru's planetary enforcement agents. Misplaced? How? Everything what her face has should be mine now. Yes, for the most part. Though I'm certain you are unaware that planetary enforcement has thought them to be too well hidden for you to claim. I've taken the liberty to acquire these accounts, holdings and lines of credit. Well, I don't want to be further into debt with those credit lines, Cena said. Find a way to make money on those or something, but find out when and where they were opened at, okay? Cena said, adjusting how she was standing and starting to pace as she thought. What other holdings do I have now? Eight storage units scattered about the planet in various degrees of scrutiny, four of which have been assessed recently, and a small single-family home in Rupar. The home is on the other side of the planet and seems to be well taken care of. Huh, okay, Selena said, running a hand through her hair. Well, it'd be tough to go through all of that myself, especially with my work with the security forces. There's no telling what's in them, and that stuff could answer a lot of my questions. I'll need a lot of help with that. I wonder if Rutak knows some people. There are no documents about what's in them, Damon said. What shall I do with the home? See if anyone's living there already, Cena answered. If there's no one there, get it assessed and inspected by someone. It's too far away for me to want to live there, so maybe I can rent it out or sell it. Renting would yield more income in the long term. That's what I'm thinking, Selena said. Do I have enough money to hire an employee? Yes, depending on wages paid. Do I have enough to pay an employee and buy a patch of land? I want to build my own office with space for my starship so I don't have to pay to store it. Perhaps, Damon said, the computer making audible noises as the digital mind drew upon more resources. I believe it is possible to buy and build something adequate to your needs, but your finances will be strained for some time. All right, get a plan ready for me. I'd like to stay around Tau V, however, Selena said, as she picked up the coffee maker, walking back up the stairs. Oh, also get a few employment contracts drafted. I'd like to be able to hire someone after the first contact day. That won't be a problem. Uh, one more thing, Selena said, midway up the stairs. Why wasn't I told of these, even if I own them? It's due to the local civil forfeiture laws here. In layman's terms, since you didn't know about them, you couldn't complain about not having them. Damon said, oddly smug. As your legal advisor, I made sure you had everything that you were entitled to in a way that could be constructed as weaponized bureaucracy. Thanks for that, she said, walking back up the stairs. If something like that happens again, be maliciously compliant. Oh, I will. One last thing. I need a way to get human foodstuffs legally. Selena said from the top of the stairs. I'd really appreciate it. I'll see what can be done about that. Thanks. Once in her kitchen, she set up a coffee maker and put the small amount of lightly roasted ground beans to brew. Goy could come through, finally, and had delivered via proxy a data cube that held instructions on how to turn green coffee beans into roasted ones. It was a highly detailed do-it-yourself holovid, and she was quite proud of what she had made, though it was a bit of a lighter roast than she had wanted. Due to the toxic nature of the beans to the locals, she had been extraordinarily careful and had only made a little bit at a time. It was enough for perhaps a mug or two. Swinging up the brewed liquid with sugar in a cream-like substance she had found on one of her shopping trips yielded something passable. Reveling in the lingering smell of coffee for the first time in ages, Selena Thomas felt on top of the world again. She stood, leaning against the counter in only her underwear, sipping on her coffee, and found herself using the last of the brew to make another mug, savouring such a rare delicious and illegal luxury. I just might kill someone for this, she said, as she held the warm mug between her hands, the synthetic, high-fidelity synth skin, relaying the sensations of warmth and the slightly raised enamel from the coffee-related cat meme embossed on the mug. Selena was quiet for a long time as she contemplated her future at Wapru. Putting her empty mug in the sink, she said out loud, I have so much work to do. Rutak was tired. He and his friends were doing Selena a favour. She had paid for everything and simply needed some people she could trust to haul a bunch of things from all over the planet back to her home. 
He had a new passphrase, as she had changed it since her abduction, since he was uncertain when everything would be done. Currently, he was refueling their rented high-capacity moving van that only his quiet friend, Ornok, was willing to pilot. The refueling station they were in was busy, as it doubled as an eatery catering to many species. It was a main junction hub for traffic, with many different crafts landing and taking off. Nuo, his overweight diachine friend, had gone inside to pay for the fuel, as well as get everyone something to eat. Knowing his friend, it was going to be some kind of junk food. Tleen, his shortest friend, also a diachine, was squished somewhere in the back seat, unable to get out easily due to the way the seats were designed, a fact that was complained upon rather loudly. Closing the fuel hatch, Rutak said to Arnok as he got into the van, Get into our parking space, you know how Nuo is. Ornok, a diachine male, somewhat taller than Rutak, nodded, drove to the edge of the platform, demarketed for large vehicles such as their van, and set it into a power save mode, while they all waited for Nuo. Opening the door, getting out and putting a lever in the bottom of the seat to fold it forward, he nodded to clean. Thanks, Or, the shorter man said, getting out and stretching his legs. I've been stuck back there for hours. We know, Rutak said, annoyance clear in his voice. Well, excuse me for voicing my displeasure of being packed away back there like cargo. At least cargo is quiet, Rutak said, causing Arnold to chuckle a bit. Fuck off, Tleen said with that ire, starting a calisthenics exercise, as he had been sitting uncomfortably for a long time. Not long later, Nuo walked up with bags of to-go food, and began to pass them out to everyone as he said, The cantina here is one of the best ones I've seen. Anyways, here you guys go. What do you know? Ornok said. As he opened the steaming cardboard container inspecting the mill, this is actually decent. I'm surprised you didn't get prepackaged junk. Oh, I got those too for the road. It has nothing to do with the fact that Rutak's alien girlfriend is paying for it all, does it? Tlaine asked, leaning on the vehicle as he inspected the food. Hey, we're all aliens on this rock, Rutak said. I still don't know what you see in that mammal, Nero said between bites. I can overlook her lack of scales, but there's no meat on her. A woman needs to have some heft to her, if you know what I mean. Hey, that's my girl you're talking about, Rutak said. Choose your next words carefully, or I'll make sure you choke on them. Easy, man, Noah replied, with a mouthful of food, and then took a long drink of something to push it all down, and quickly said, I meant no foul. Or not cut into the conversation, breaking up a potential fight before it could start. We're all tired, we've been at this for hours and we have one last stop left. Let's just eat, finish this up, and then go back to Tau V. Hey, Sling said to everyone. Where are we putting all this stuff anyway? Surely it won't fit all in Rutak's girl's place. No, it won't, Rutak said. I know, stuff his face, then turned to Tleen. Selena wants to go through this and get all the tech and documents, if there's any. She said we can have pretty much anything as we find. That old hoverbike in there looks pretty cool, Noah said carefully. No one did the anger his friend. I doubt it even works, with how old that design looks, Arnok said. I'm sure it still does, with how clean it looks, Rutak said. But I think Selina would want to keep that. I would. Maybe you can ask for it instead of the pay she promised us, Newell, Tleen said. Or have to buy it with the pay as a deduction. It's something to think about, Ornok said. Well, break's pretty much over. If you need to piss, do it now. Fleen was lifting a box of something out of the way from inside the final storage unit, so that Nuo and Ornok could lift the large cabinet into their rented moving van. Rutek was off to the side, breathing heavily from moving a heavy-duty machine of some kind that looked remarkably like a 3D printer of some design, but most certainly was not. Wait for those two before putting it into the van, Rutek panted out. Fucking hell, that was heavier than it looked. It doesn't look heavy, Tling said, setting the box of stuff down. What is it? It's his ice rod system CNC machine, Rutek said, as Nuo and Arnok loaded the lower lift with the cabinet. I use those at work, Nuo said. As Arnok activated the lift system. That's a portable version. I wasn't sure when I saw it earlier. I thought it was a weird 3D printer. Good company, Arnok said. As he and Noah pushed the large cabinet into an empty space. Ouch, Arnok said. Shaking his hand and looking at one of his digits. Sorry, my claw slipped a bit, Noah said. Here, put this somewhere, Clean said. Loading up the box he had from earlier into the bed of the van. As the lift was still raised. Sure, Noah said. Picking up the box and then called over his shoulder, and gave me a mag cable. Rutek was loading into the small storage unit, seeing what else was there. The artisan-made wooden cabinet and the CNC machine had been the biggest objects, taking up a vast majority of the small space, while the rest of the items were boxes or crates of various sizes. 
If this unit was like the previous ones they had cleared out, the stuff in the boxes were computers, assorted electronic parts and other kinds of non-perishable high-end wares, and sometimes a weapon or four. Something that could be easily pawned off for quick cash and mundane things to obfuscate suspicion, such as the cabinet. Hearing an electrical whine of a hovercar a few units over, and then two doors close, Rutek turned to see who it was out of a combination of caution and curiosity. The hovercar was a common model, nothing special nor out of the ordinary about it. However, two Nimians walked out and headed towards them, after pausing to look around for but a moment. The bigger one said, putting out an air of authority, You have something of ours. Nero hopped out of the back of the moving van, landing hard on his feet, making his bulk shake a bit. You don't own shit here, he said, as he made himself look threatening. State your business, Ornok said, as he landed much more nimbly next to Nuo, and maybe you will listen. Sling got out from the cab of the moving van, holding a set of tying cables, looking for Ornok and Nuo to the two Nimians, not quite sure what was going on. Rutek had moved out into view, next to Ornok and Nuo, a modified pulse pistol in his hand, though it was held to his side. The smaller Nimian looked to the other, then said, We want no trouble. Just something in the wooden cabinet. The rest of that shit is yours. What's in there that's so special? Rutek asked. Documents, the bigger Nimian said. I am Rutek and his pulse pistol. For me and this asshole to jump planet. Where in the cabinet? Ornok asked, taking the lead. Center drawer on the left side, the Nimian replied. You have to pull it all the way out. It's got a fake backing, and inside there should be a shitty puzzle box. Tleen, Rutek said. Get your oblivious tail in the van and look for it. Right, Tleen answered, and climbed up into the moving van with the built-in steps. After a few tense minutes, he handed the puzzle box to Ornok as Rutek had his dull attention on the two Nimians. Ornok looked over the plain wooden puzzle box and opened it after a few tries. Inside he saw multiple plastic identification cards that his nose told him were fake but looked quite authentic, as well as jewellery that looked like it would be pawned off for a decent price. Taking half the jewellery and then locking the puzzle box back up, handing the jewellery to Tleen, he walked to a halfway point between them and set the box down, going back to the others. That should get you both off world and some change, Ornok said, if you're thiefty. After the smaller Nimian grabbed the puzzle box and went back to the hover car, the big one said to the Gabadaya Shins, A word of caution, Rutak. Something big is going down soon. I'd get off this rock if I were you. Jinyaka's client doesn't like her money going to waste. Before Rutek could speak, the Nibian got into the active hover car and sped off. Let's load the rest of this up and get out of here, Nua said. I feel like I narrowly avoided losing my tail. Why would you let them keep some of the jewellery? Tleen asked, handing the valuables to Rutek once he was done powering down his pulse pistol. Sometimes you just need a helping claw, Ornok said. A small amount of mercy can go a long way. I just hope it doesn't bite off my tail. Makes as much sense as anything else, you'd say, Glean said with a shrug, then scared Rutek. How'd the Nimia know it was you? I was on the news for a while, and this was that Tezel's weapon, Rutek said, showing Tleen the powered down modified pause pistol, the one that shot me up like a practice sheet. Oof, Tleen said. Good thing those pulses were low power. Yeah, I'd be dead otherwise. You ladies gonna help or stand around and look pretty? Nua asked, arms holding a box. We're coming, Rutek said. Let's hurry this up. 